Welcome to Conversations with Carolia, where we take a nuanced deep dive into all things related to spirituality, sexuality, power, and awakening. My name is Carolia, and I'm your host for this journey. I invite you to relax back, open up, and get curious. And don't forget to subscribe, like, and share the love. Good afternoon, good evening, possibly good morning. Welcome to the next conversation with Carolia. Today I am interviewing Nina K. Tane Tinoro. Nina K is an amazing woman. I first met her in a car park actually at a yoga conference. Um, she teaches Kemetic yoga, which is an Egyptian form of yoga, but that is just one very small thing that Nina K does. Uh, she is the older sister of Tikitane and she is his manager, has been since I think around 2007. She's an executive on the Māori Music Industry Coalition. She's a founding member of a Māori Music Managers Development Initiative. She is a celebrity speaker. She's a mentor. She's a mother. She's a grandmother. She has been uh, very public about her sobriety history. She, uh, I think in April 2021, celebrated 20 years sobriety. Sobriety, I'm not even sure, of being sober. I'm like, am I getting that word right? Of being sober and talks about her journey of recovering from drug and alcohol addiction and her journey of being a stripper in her early 20s. Uh, so I am really intrigued by Nina Kay. I think she's a powerhouse of a woman. I actually feel a little bit intimidated by her sometimes um, because she just has such a, a center. And I've been following her on Instagram ever since I met her in the car park at the yoga conference. And I just love the way that she dives into all the things like for example looking at the history of alcohol in Aotearoa and the reaction that happened um, and the way that it was banned like there was a there was a movement to try and ban, ban it for example in the king country where Nina Kay is from we'll talk more of that in the conversation suffice to say of course I'm excited I am a little bit nervous and I'm really curious to see where this particular conversation goes because there's so much scope for us to talk about sexuality, you know, about power, about awakening, about all the things. So no further ado, let's dive in to the conversation. Nina Kay, welcome to Conversations with Carolia. Yeah, older Carolia, thank you for having me. Where okay. in the world are you right now, for those who won't know? Sure. Um, I'm in Hamilton. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Waikato, New Zealand. Mm, and is that where you fuck a papa too? The Waikato? Uh, we actually, well, we do have some links here, but we're mainly fuck a papa to Maniapoto, which is, we, we are like the Waitomo Caves, Kafia uh -huh. uh, area, yeah. which is a little bit further along. So, mm -hmm. yeah. See, I would go, oh, that's all kind of the same area, but it's not at all, is it? It's, yeah. Well, you're right in some ways because we refer to the both of them and, and other parts as Tainui Waka. So we can mm -hmm. say oh, Tainui, you know, because the waka, when the ancestral canoe came in, it kind of spread across that area. The, the mm. second. But then it's been also broken up into different tribes. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm. So I've got you on the show because I've been following you on Instagram ever since we met at the New Zealand Yoga Conference, the Hawara Conference, which would have been pre-COVID or in the middle of COVID maybe? It was pre-COVID. It definitely was. Yeah. 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 And I just okay. love how on your Instagram you speak to all the things. Um, <laughs> you speak about, you know, you do, you speak about your journey of sobriety and what that's meant to you over the years. Um, you recently went on a nine month journey on Tinder and we're really upfront about speaking about what that was like for you. And of course, one of the topics of this um, show is sexuality. So maybe we could start there about what inspired you to jump on Tinder. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, for sure. I had um, been fiercely, staunchly um, single and celibate for a number of years after my last relationship which was 16 years and mm. I was pretty 
for many different reasons, I was rather traumatized after all of that, that whole experience, um, to, especially towards the end of it. And I, yeah, so I, I didn't even feel like I was a, a, a desirable human. You know, I was mm. a, felt like I was just a slab of, I don't know. <laughs> I just mm. didn't, feel, yeah, I didn't feel like I had much to offer in that way. And I also couldn't locate my desire anymore either like my sexual mm. desire it was like it was just non-existent um and so I went through a phase of being very fiercely single also because I wanted to focus on the well-being of my children and of myself mainly for a few years but I sort of started to get a bit warmer over time you know <laughs> <laughs> I like that warming yeah. up yeah, I started warming up a bit and then it was, I actually went on a bit of a, a journey back into my past into the, I, I recognized that I had this kind of shadow thing going on and it was associated with my time working in the sex industry when I, I fell into that when I was 19 years old and I was a peep show dancer and a stripper and I stayed in that for four years and became addicted to drugs and alcohol and I kind of, and then I end up in this long relationship after that. So I'd sort of never really dealt with that, if you know what I mean. Mm. It was like I'd never, I'd never really faced that um, whole as aspect of my life. And the, there were two um, kind of personas I took on during that time because you're encouraged to not use your own identity when you work in the sex industry. So I was Courtney to some and to others, I was Dana, you know. <laughs> So I kind of went through this thing of wanting to really meet and embrace Courtney and Dana again. And and that was a really incredible personal journey to go through for like a couple mm. of years. And that definitely reignited this kind of um, energy within me mm -hmm. because I got a hole and, you know, I kind of went back into mm. that place of what it felt like in my body to um to be desirable and to be desired in that sense and so um from there it kind of it was like a bit of an awakening reawakening mm. and I started to kind of test the waters and wanting to engage with men because I'm I'm heterosexual my, my, mm -hmm. my, you know and so um yeah kind of dipping my toe into little experiences and then mm. What happened was it was actually because my father and I were always he he's passed on a couple of years ago, but we were always very, very transparent with each other about anything and everything. And so I was talk talking with him quite a bit and sharing a bit about my journey. Um mm. being becoming, you know, wanting to re-engage with with men again. And he same with him, with women because dad mm -hmm. had gone through a similar phase of kind of shutting himself down for years after him and mum separated. So anyways, what ended up happening was, <laughs> I'm getting there, <laughs> was that he was, when dad was, um, he got diagnosed with terminal cancer. And so we all, all us children and, and our mother basically moved in with him because we knew mm. that he was going to pass in a couple of weeks. And during that time, he said to me, why don't you start dating like why don't you get get yourself out there you're a, you're a beautiful young woman and all this kind of thing and he really mm. raised up and he said it's time for you to let go of the past you know and mm. yeah sorry a bit emotional yeah I can understand why <laughs> how beautiful of your dad to see you and support you you know yeah. in those final weeks in that way totally it was very yeah special. yeah and he said you know You've been through a lot, but now it's time for you to do something for you, you know, mm. and follow, follow your heart or follow your body or whatever it is. Go and ex mm -hmm. explore and experience all your senses. <laughs> yeah. So pretty much after he passed, I think it was, it was only a matter of weeks. And I started thinking, yep, I'm going to do that, dad. I'm going to start dating. And of course, I didn't really know, have any idea how. Yeah. Like, how does one do that nowadays, right? Exactly. <laughs> and I'm like a... It's not like you can go to a bar. No, right? right? And I'm a sober woman, right? You know, yeah. I've been in 
I've been in recovery for almost 22 years and it's like it's it's not that attractive going to a bar and trying to you know engage with drunk men it just isn't it's really unappealing for me so yeah, um, yeah so I had had a couple of times a friend had visited and she'd show me her tinder profile and we'd had a good little giggle over it and I thought mm -hmm. okay I'm gonna do that I'm gonna try that so I went on there thinking this is a dating app but um I realized pretty within the first month that it's um this is not going to get me any dates this is only going to get me hookups you know like mm. yeah and I kind of I fell into it I just in the end I went well maybe that's actually what I want maybe mm -hmm. I don't want to go on a date maybe I don't want to sit there with somebody you know and try, and have, <laughs> try and have conversation you know maybe that's a bit awkward maybe I'd rather just have sex you know mm. so, yeah so that's basically what I did was I went on this I just kind of fell into it for nine months of just yeah exploration up. yeah 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 totally. I definitely the, the background the context is important like you said working in the in the sex industry for those four years from like 19 to 23 and then because you became you, you that relationship you had, that's when you had your children as well wasn't it yes. so then you're in a relationship you're having children and then it sounds like you started to possibly integrate Yes. Courtney and is it yeah. Dana 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 <laughs> yeah yeah it sounds like you're integrating and then going okay now what let's explore yeah um, definitely what what did you look because like I mean I've I've jumped on tinder a couple of times and I just I struggle with it I struggle to know if I'm actually genuinely attracted to any of the men if I genuinely does and it seems like you know so much hassle to try and even set up a date um, you know, and when I was jumping on, like I am a single parent and my son was younger. So then there's all the, you know, I have to make arrangements and it's really challenging and it costs money and, oh my God, it's just too hard. So I give up, delete my profile and exit the scene. Absolutely. Um, well done. Yeah. Just, uh, but the same, the same thing. It's like, how, how does one, you come know, in my forties and I was like, how does one meet? How does one date in one's forties? Yeah um yeah. so going back you're on tinder and it's not dating and you've just gone all right I'm just going to explore sexuality mm -hmm. so what did you discover what did you learn in terms of the yeah. sexual environment that's out there now which I imagine has been pretty heavily influenced by porn right definitely you've just hit the nail on the head and um you know it's I think it yeah it, it it kind of at times shocked me what mm. what happened what was going on and I was trying to I think every experience I had I'd try to learn something for it to prepare me for the next experience but it kind of was just like this roller coaster and I don't think I ever really um you know felt like I had a handle on any of it it was pretty crazy it was a bit wild and yeah. um yeah and I what was happening was I was getting inundated by younger men uh, well actually what happened first was I looked for men around my own age you know because I'm mm -hmm. 48 and I, I didn't really think 48 year old men I, I was more like I'll look at sort of 35 to 45 just mm -hmm. because I, I'm fully aware that I have a quite a young energy and quite a young yep. um, exterior as well and so I <laughs> thought I thought, you know, there's possibly not many men who can match that in their age group of 48 up. I yeah. may be wrong, and I, I'm yeah, hoping. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I know what you mean. It's like there's a youthfulness, right? There yes. is a youthfulness. And then yes. I find the same thing. I meet men that are my own age. I'm like, you seem so much older than I feel, oh, or, you know. Yeah. Yes. And plus, yeah. I think I'd kind of chatted with a couple of 40 plus uh, like 45 year old men and it was not good I just felt yeah. like they were very stuck in their ways not open um yeah. you know and it was it was kind of like wow I really I'm at a place in my life where I really want to meet people who are very open and yeah and um yeah not judgmental and all yeah. that kind of thing and so yeah so I kind of put the settings a bit lower I basically went from 25 to 35 and mm -hmm. then and then of course I was inundated with you know 25 to 28 year olds mainly it was just phenomenally ridiculous <laughs> and, 
every time I looked in Tinder, there was just a whole new <laughs> scene of 25 to 28 year old. A new smorgasbord of um, menu choices. <laughs> Well, ex exactly. And, you know, and, and later on, I've reflected on this later um, around how actually dangerous that was for me as someone who's struggled with addiction in my past. Yeah. That it's that whole thing of being in a lolly shop and having having all these lollies and then just wanting to eat lots of them. Mm -hmm. So it was um, actually quite dangerous for me, but it took me, I had to go through the whole experience before I yeah. realized that. I didn't recognize it because it looked different, the whole addiction thing. Yeah. I thought it's not alcohol, it's not drugs. I'm yeah. fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's still the dopamine hit though, is it? Still that kind yeah. of like getting the hit. Yeah. Yes. That yeah. And I love that when I saw you put the Instagram post up where you were reflecting and because you'd come off it and you were like, Oh, I'm just now realizing that the pattern of behavior that was playing out was similar to that with alcohol and drugs. Totally. Yeah. And, and I've I still haven't fully worked out whether the hit was actually coming from the app it's from using the app itself you know mm -hmm. just like okay end of a long day the kids are in bed oh my god get into the app let's have a look yeah you yeah know, like a little hit there or whether it was actually the hit of okay great he's hot we're chatting it's great he wants to meet up I want to meet up oh my god now I'm going to organize to meet up and go and meet up with him or if it's yeah you know, that was the, the the lolly or whether it was the actual sex mm -hmm. but one thing I knew I know for sure is that afterwards I never felt amazing <laughs> mm, that's always a good indication right <laughs> <laughs> wait not feeling amazing hmm. um through this like you you're a yoga teacher you teach comedic yoga which is an Egyptian yoga when yeah. did you start practicing yoga and then teaching yoga yeah, I, I started um, practicing yoga when I was 14. And, oh, wow. Um, so yeah, a long so time. Yeah. Four years ago. Yeah, it was when mum and dad separated. And because I used to have to, we lived kind of just out of the city in Christchurch. And I used to have to get two buses to school. So I was used yeah. to busing into the city every day and then busing out to school and then reversing that on the way home. So the whole busing into the city thing, I started to kind of look around and go, what, uh, what is it? What's actually in the city? And then I started going to, you know, I saw there was a gym and I thought, oh, well, I wouldn't mind training because dad was, was always such an incredible role model for fitness. And um, yeah, I started going to the gym and then realizing they had yoga. So that, that became it for me. I was practicing mm. every day by going to the classes at the gym. And then I started teaching when my daughter, so she what would have been 2005, I mm -hmm. actually started teaching yoga. And that was a friend had a gym here in Hamilton and he had watched me train myself from being, you know, post, mm -hmm. um, post natal kind of phase back into healthy and strong and fit again. Yeah. And then, and then he said, um, you know, would you ever consider taking some classes? And I said, yeah, because I'd also been going to Les Mills a lot and had kind of, I knew their templates. Yeah, <laughs> like the yeah. Backpack, yeah. You know, body <laughs> balance know. classes and, you know, body pump. Yeah. I was like, I'm sure I could whip a yeah. class together. So I did. I whipped together a um a class and then I got so, I started off teaching like a kind of body balance rip off at the, at the YMCA in Hamilton and then, and then I started really researching yoga. I'd get out every book in the library and I'd just pour over it and I'd take notes. And, you know, I had books uh, um, that I'd write in and draw pictures in. And it was a big deal for me, you know. And then mm. I, yeah, so I just got more and more into it. And then I um, started teaching in the community, like mainly with our Māori community, like it, mm. with, you know, with kapahaka and stuff like that, I'd go teacher early mornings when they were waking up from their livings and yeah I've mm. kind of yeah I've been doing it ever since I think, yeah yeah so how do you how, how did that inform your journey on tinder like did it in any way because it sounds <laughs> you know it, it sounds like there was that self-awareness and self-reflection and that curiosity that I, I associate that with yoga yes. you know so much more than just the postures so 
no. that's what I'm curious about. And and also, I guess, what I've noticed from doing my own practice is that my sensitivity, my my ability to sense and, and feel and read someone is a lot stronger. So I wondered how you found, if that's similar for you, and how you felt interacting with different men in terms of what you would attune or pick up or, you know? Oh, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's such a great question. Yeah, I guess, you know, there was this definite, I think, especially when it came to these younger men, you know, these men who are 20 years younger than me plus, it started to, you know, I started to feel this sense of responsibility that it was, uh, first of all, I enjoyed the energy, you know, yeah. because it was typically they have a youthful energy, they have a lot of energy, and they're very open and fluid and keen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So just like, and, and different varying degrees of it. I mean, some of them are great communicators, you know, mm. but, um, and I really, I, did, I must say, I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed just connecting with that, that type of energy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because I think not... that's why we talk about, um, you know, you've got decades of yoga practice, why men who are in their 40s, if they've got no practice, that the rigidity, the close mm -hmm. down that, like energetically, I feel like as yogis, we match better with younger men because they're still open, they're still fluid, yeah. there's, there's an energetic match. Yeah, absolutely. I think I, I really picked up on, though, there's this genuine the whole craving of younger men to to match with and engage with an older woman, even though it's it's delivered in a way where it's about sex, mm. I got this really deep sense that it was way beyond that. Mm. It was actually more about needing a certain type of nurturing in their life. Ah. And, yeah, despite that it, had, it came in that form and that's – a lot to do with the porn stuff and you know the stepmother fantasy and all those kind of things the the older woman the mature and all that kind of stuff that they mm. have may have watched on on through porn but I really did get a sense that there was a deep deep emotional need and once I kind of clicked onto that I would try to kind of work that into the mm. whole thing yeah because um yeah, and tried to, it was almost became like a bit of a research thing for me of, yeah, yeah, and then I tried to kind of set it up prior a little bit that way as well, but in the end, I realized it was actually just, I won't say a waste of my time, but it was kind yeah. of, you know, because nothing's really, I don't regret anything in my life really, but it was, it was kind of like, uh, there's probably better forums and ways of me actually, <laughs> actually doing this. If this yeah. is my purpose, then yeah. get through sex is not actually the way. Helping yeah. younger men, you know, so I need to kind of just close that door and mm. step into, you know, like the work that I do now with um, male sex offenders. I do, I'm working with them now yeah. one week in Auckland and that's um, definitely way more where, where I belong. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Can you share a little bit about that work, like how you got into that, what it what it feels like to work with sexual offenders? Yeah, I mean, I'm still pretty fresh to it. I'm still a bit of a baby to it. But the the whole it started when I was in the working in the music industry and being on the being a trustee of what we call the Maori Music Industry Coalition, mm -hmm. and so we have been wanting to we've been supporting these workshops that occur in the music industry that are free and they're about um, professional respect and prevention of sexual harm within the music industry. Mm -hmm. And so they're a full day's workshop. They're wonderful. I've attended one. And then we kind of talked about how the fact that not many Māori were showing up or Polynesian mm -hmm. or other cultures. And so um, we, we're exploring creating one that is more from a te ao Māori view so mm -hmm. I ended up, but I ended up co-facilitating some of the generic ones anyway, alongside of the incredible creators of the of the program. That then led to me being asked if I could work alongside of 
um, this organisation that I work with today up in Auckland called Kōrawai Tū Manako because there was a case um, that was to do with a, a man from the music industry, a Māori man, mm-hmm. and they just thought, well, because I'm from the industry, it would be really helpful to have me involved in his rehabilitation. So I did that last year, and um, that's where I started to really know that this is actually something I'm deeply passionate about. And mm. you know, thinking about my sons, my grandson, and my hopes mm. for them, in, in the way that they treat women and all those things. And then also thinking about my daughter and the things that, you know, she may come up against in her life. Also thinking about my father because he he disclosed to us, um, you know, a few years before he passed about sexual abuse that occurred mm. when he had a child. And yeah. so, yeah, it was just all those things. And I thought, uh, w- w- but what really sealed it for me was really being invited to come and do the work because the elders that I work alongside of have been doing this for 30 plus years and and really hard to find people who are passionate about it yeah it's it's a rare thing to have especially women who can work with male offenders yeah 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 it's I can it's like an area of taboo almost like to to open to and support men who have violated on that yeah there's yeah. so much wounding around it so much so whereas I guess yeah. for me because of you know I because I've been having to deal with my my stuff for a while now and also yeah. from sex industry work and my sobriety I feel really strong I feel like I am in a position where I can authentically support men on their journey and not yeah. not judge them and force you know put boxes around them and all that sort of thing I will always see them as a family member first and foremost rather mm-hmm. than looking at them as being a rapist or a predator or yeah. a brother. and it's separating out the behavior but yeah but in terms of tinder that is genuinely what concerned me the most aside from my own stuff around becoming like really like whoa with it all yeah it's also the behavior of of the men and how they were kind of perpetuating this porn thing and uh, and and some of the behaviors that they were, were practicing without you know there was an assumption that I would like to be choked there was an assumption that I'd like to be spanked or slapped even and or spat on or mm. you know, had my had my hair pulled really forcefully, um, you know, and all this kind of thing, and spoken to a certain way, and it was just like, what? <laughs> right. So no dialogue beforehand in terms of setting boundaries and expectations, no. and no. Yeah. And that's where my I realized how naive I was as well. But I thought, you you know, these it concerned me deeply <clears throat> that so many men that I engaged with would it was like a default Mm. and that there was just no not even a notion of consent or and there was I think also because I was older because you Mm -hmm. know obviously you can you can type my name into google and you'll all my stuff will come up so they could easily research me see that I had a pass with the sex industry and there's these assumptions Uh. yeah also, right but therefore you you're into being dominated and you're you're a bit slutty and you're into being choked and you know there's just all these kind of assumptions that they make yeah no I'm neither of those things you've you've got it wrong yeah, yeah not actually... I, lo- I loved how you did the Instagram post where you just named that stuff and you brought it out to into the light into the surface and just you know because I wonder what's it like for younger women who are on those apps or interacting and having those experiences and feeling like they're meant to go along, et cetera, that this is just what it's like. This is how you get liked and et cetera. Yeah. And that, that is the concern because I've, I have had lengthy conversations with my daughter who's now 19 and she's a mother herself. She's a teenage mother. And I know she doesn't mind me sharing this because I've talked about it before and checked with her first, but around um, the behaviors on dating apps and she 
she you know her and her age group her friends her cousins often would tell me that it was expected those behaviors are expected and you they're normalized you know like back yeah. in the day for us it might have been a kiss and uh, um holding hands and maybe a nipple tweak or something <laughs> these, these days these yeah. days it's full blown choking um you know spanking really hard pulling the head back really hard you know these are the things yeah. that are expected um when you're engaging sexually with an, a man and even to the point of where rape is expected that's what alarmed me is that if kids are having a party, teenagers are having a party together, there is an almost an expectation that someone is going to be raped. What? I know. It's what fright. the Yes. I mean, it and... almost feels like with all the sex education, with all the stuff over the last few decades, that we haven't necessarily improved things. Necess- I don't think which... so. And I think if you it's, it's it makes sense because if you look at the widespread accessibility of yeah of pornography now there is nothing stopping anyone from being able to access pornography you know if we really want to and so we can we can have it on the bus ride home we can have it at school um in our locker yeah it's crazy yeah 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 and in those once those images are in your head etc i mean i have a zero porn tolerance like if i'm if I'm seeing someone, that's a non-negotiable right from the get-go that there is zero porn. Amazing. And it's not that I'm making that person do that. I'm just saying, this is how I operate. If you want to engage with me, these are the rules of engagement. And it needs to be it needs to be a genuine, yeah, I'm happy to do that. Not a, oh, yeah, I'm going to say yes and then go behind. You know, no, fuck that shit. And you know what? I can I can tell by the way a man makes love if he's been watching porn or not. It's in his field. It's so apparent and so obvious. And I'm just like, nah, where you like, it's just a nah. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. But, I, yeah. But the reality is, right, it's it's rife. And it's I endemic. think, it's, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's like saying, you know, if I was to say I have a zero alcohol thing, you know, then I'd probably end up, there's probably only one in 10,000 men who would actually. <laughs> well it depends on the circles though like I mean I move in the conscious festival scene where there isn't a lot of alcohol and none of my friends drink alcohol and some of my male friends have been through their own porn journey and come out the other side like and they talk about it you know and so yeah and you know most of the men that I know they are on the other side of that journey and it is just a no-go for them so there are pockets of people yeah. that operate in that way but I'm really aware if I was to go into a mainstream event or gathering that most people would be using alcohol and most of the men you know I don't know what the percentage is would be using porn yeah I mean definitely in my circles like Maori community alcohol is incredibly normalized and yeah. so very hard to find very rare sorry not hard because I'm not searching but it's rare to come across somebody who, a male who doesn't touch doesn't alcohol. Doesn't drink. Mom, yeah. Very, very, very rare. Or a Polynesian male. I mean, I'm really attracted to them. So, you know, but. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so it's it's tricky. And then, but it, that's okay. I'm fine with that because I know yeah. what, what's good for me and what's not. But in, And with the porn thing, yeah, same thing again. It's like, it's, it's quite normalized and it's alarming. Yeah. And seeing how our our youth are using it as well. You know, the statistics yeah. around that are through the roof. I know. And I have a teenage son and I'm just like, I need to have those. And I feel like, yeah, I feel like it's the men in his life that need to have those conversations with him. Yeah. I mean, I, it's a tricky one because, yeah, you have to make sure the men understand it before they even have the conversations. So yeah, you've well, that's to- true. <laughs> men who, who, are, who have their head together about porn and because I mean at the end of the day the way I see it is it's about teaching them that as long as they understand what they are looking at they're able to recognize what is um, safe and consensual and what's healthy about it because there is some porn that you can argue is healthier than others right mm. Porn where you can where you're 
where you're seeing consent and you're seeing healthy caring mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. engagement I don't know where that is but anyway apparently it exists right and then you've got the other more way more normalized yeah. um, type, which is you know objectification of women typically and violence and aggression yeah. so it's about teaching the difference because it's highly likely that our children especially our boys are going to stumble across it or yeah watching it with friends and yeah. if we can arm them with that kind of um and uh, I suppose and discernment yeah. yeah discernment then at yeah. least can be in there sitting with their boys at a party watch where someone puts on porn and they're all watching it and go actually so that's not really very cool what's going yeah. on there and kind of maybe and in, 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 in initiate some healthy conversation about it you know yeah that would be amazing have yes. you ever done any of the conscious sexuality stuff within the yoga kind kind of the yoga world like ista or anything like that oh i haven't i'd love to yeah. though yeah yeah i mean i just asked because i mean it's a bit of a controversial topic and i've had a few different people on the show um but there are there is conscious sexuality work that's out there that looks at all the shed, shadow around sexuality and looks at consent and looks at all of these things and and arms i don't know if arms people is the right word but at least explores this kind of thing i mean i'd love to see it in schools but trying to get that kind of education into in, into schools like i know they have mates and dates and that you know those kind of consent orientated things but i can't imagine them doing the deeper kind of sexual shadow work <laughs> not definitely not and um yeah no you're right it's the kind of thing that because most you know i know especially in maori communities and polynesian communities it's it's quite taboo to be talking about sex these days and that's the impacts yeah. of christianity and colonization yeah. you know but yeah and so a lot of the time no one knows where to go to talk about it or even how to talk about it and then what yeah. kind of language to use when to talk yeah. about it. so it's, it just ends up you just end up not talking about it and that's yeah. the concern you know and that's how I think we end up with people doing you know with, with deviant behavior is because it's just yeah. not even being there's no ear on it it's not being it's yeah not, yeah and I love because the the one of the um elders that I work with he what does he say? He says, um, sex itself is sacred, but mm. the conversation doesn't need to be, mm. yeah, which I like. Mm. So he encourages the conversation. He encourages us to talk about it because the fact that we're not talking about it is how it is. Then all this abuse can be kept hidden yeah. in a carpet, you know. Yeah. The fine line between yeah. being yeah safe and unsafe so yeah because it's yeah. such an amazing dance when two people commune together with physical and emotional intimacy and energetic intimacy like it's the most extraordinary thing ever so it's no wonder that there is so much around it because yeah. people are wanting to experience it there's a part of people I think that knows what's possible yes. and there's a mistaken idea that it's the physical actions that get you there like you know going back to porn again but it's really about the intimacy that arises on a deeper level isn't it and how how do you teach if people aren't intimate with themselves how can they in, be intimate with others yes and, oh. and so and so the physical thing just becomes the the primary objective goal and method of going yeah. about it which is what I discovered with all these you know younger men 25 to 30 year old kind of thing yeah. most of them we're just functioning in that way the yeah. probably the most fulfilling I experience I had through my tinder time was with a 25 year old man who mm. had been raised he was he's a Samoan man had been raised by his grandmother and his aunties and he was so beautiful and he was a very mm. caring caring person and very had a beautiful nurturing energy in touch with his emotions and communication wonderful communicator and that to me was like amazing yeah <laughs> yeah 
That's yeah. awesome. I, that's, that's a cool story to share as well. Blessings to all those amazing men out there who are in touch with their emotions and do move from that space and to all the men doing men's work because there is a lot of men's work happening in it, particularly in the sexuality space, um, okay. which is beautiful to see. So uh, just to switch kind of focus for a little while, mm-hmm. um, Kemetic yoga, Egyptian mm-hmm. yoga, how did you discover this and why did it appeal to you out of all the different approaches to yoga? Because you were like one of the few people here in, in New Zealand that offers this, right? Yes, yes. So I, I'm i trying to think what year it was, but it was probably about 2016. I started, well, because because I'd been teaching at the YMCA and then there became this whole, you need to become a registered exercise professional. You need yeah. to have a certificate in order to continue teaching and there was all this kind of pressure around that and so I started to look I was like okay well I've been teaching for a while now you know 10 over 10 years but I don't actually have a certificate so I tried different New Zealand you know places around the country that offered um, certification and it just was too hard it was either like, I don't know, I just felt like there were barriers there for me. Like no one was taking me seriously as mm. a Māori woman who wanted to, mm. you know, who'd been teaching for years. It was like no one thought that that was, um, had any meaning to it. It was just like, you're, uh, yeah, it was, it was different. Mm. I, I, I struggled with it. And then I, yeah, and either that or it would cost ten thousand dollars, you know, for Bikram or whatever. And we know where that ended up going. Yeah. But um, so yeah, so, yeah, and you've got to travel to India for three months or whatever. So it was like it just felt so unac- inaccessible for me, and it was I struggled because I love yoga so much, and I just felt like I wasn't going to be able to pursue my my dream of being approved to teach it in that sense. Yeah. Even though, again, you'd I been knew, teaching for 10 odd yeah, years and you'd been yeah. practicing for however long. I know. Exactly. Right. And the majority of my community, they, I mean, they didn't care they, whether I had a certificate or not. But um, so I started looking online and then because I, I started thinking, well, actually, do I want to learn from a learn this traditional ancient form from a Kiwi anyway? You know what I mean? Like I actually, that's not who I, I would rather go to the source and learn. Mm-hmm. Um, and learn the language properly and learn the the contexts and the concepts and all this sort of things. So I started to really search. And I ended up stumbling across comedic yoga, which was still re- reasonably new in terms of the certification side of it. And I reached out to the man who was the... Um, we call him the re the revolutionary revolutionist of it. You see, you see Raho Tip. I reached out to him. He's an older black man who lives in mm-hmm. Chicago, and just said, you know, this is who I am, and this is what I'm trying to wanting to do, and you know, I, he replied and just said, wow. You know, because he said, you're in New Zealand, and I, he'd never mm. heard of the Māori people, and, you know, he was wow. really, yeah, he was really, we made this amazing connection, yeah. and then we started to exchange lots of um, information and talk and stuff, and then he offered for me to come over and become certified in one of his courses, and he said, if you just get yourself there, and pay for your accommodation the rest will be taken care of so Mm. yeah it was at a really challenging time in my life actually it was hard but I managed to get it together and get the children looked after long enough for me to get on a plane and go to Jamaica which is where he was holding that particular um, certification retreat and um, yeah before I went so I was so I was a, no there was no there were no comedic yoga instructors in Aotearoa yeah. at that stage and I'd woken up one morning and thought of a friend of mine and I rang her and said I'm going to do this and I you you're on my mind and I wondered would you be interested in coming and she said 
oh hell yeah <laughs> so, no so, way <laughs> yeah so she came with me and it's quite funny yeah. because both of us are just, were just like these naive little Maori girls who didn't really research Jamaica properly for starters. And then when we got over there, it was like, <laughs> oh my gosh, where are we? This is amazing. Mm. Um, so, so yeah, that's how I ended up there. And, you know, just spending time with um, you, Sarah, as well. What an incredible man, you know, because it was, mm. it was a risk for me to take to trust in this man who I'd mm. never met and you know there was all that stuff going on around like Bikram and stuff at the time and yeah. it was like this is it's definitely a risk but I feel I have a really good feeling about this in my my stomach you know my puku is telling me this is going to be the right thing to do and then once we got over there it was all evident that mm. this was the right thing to do what a beautiful man to learn from incredible mentor an incredible example and mm. so yeah it was it was pretty amazing and then I came back and um Hedia my friend Hedia and I were yeah the first two comedic yoga instructors in Aotearoa we now have five so mm -hmm. that's amazing to have some other sisters yeah because you're at New Zealand Yoga Day and you had the five of you up on stage and the what I noticed, I didn't actually do the practice, I but I was observing. And what I noticed was there seemed to be, A, such power and clarity. There was just a real clearness in the transmission. It was so grounded. Um, wow. And it feels like there's a lot of context. Like it's not just poses, right? There's philosophy that underpins it that comes from Egypt. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's ancient ancient Egypt, Africa. So they it's yeah, they say commit and it's like when Egypt, Egypt, Africa kind of thing was all one back in mm -hmm. like way, way, way back in ancient times, and then it kind of all split apart. But it's yeah, yeah. And it's basically it's it's coming from the pyramids. If you if you were to go to the pyramids, you would you would see these poses in there. I yeah, guess. they're in the hieroglyphics, aren't they? Yeah, totally. Yeah, and in the stories and it's Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. So this is this is what you're offering to your community now is comedic. Well, I haven't to be fair, I haven't been holding regular classes for a while. Co once COVID hit, that was a yeah. I went online, you know, I got asked to yeah. do for free, provide them online for for communities. Um so I did that all through COVID and then I was just exhausted. I was actually yeah. exhausted afterwards. And so kind of just stepped back from it all went mm. back to just my own practice you know mm -hmm. doing it for myself and my family and then because of the breath work that we do is so powerful meditative work it's just stunning and it's self-healing you know it's it's yeah it provides us with a vehicle to and a tool to be able to self-heal mm -hmm. all day every day if we want to so it's very very powerful and I yeah, I haven't, at this stage, I kind of just try to still keep it in like national events or yeah. you know, large events so that it's like we still have a bit of a, hey, we, we're here, we're here. Yeah, but, but, I like and, that. Yeah, which is amazing. I'm so grateful to, you know, like Franco for for supporting us to do that and um and Revive Festival were great too. But yeah. we I'm not teaching regular sessions. So it's um, but but a couple of others are like um, Maka Maka Nakatuwe in Auckland. She's mm -hmm. she's doing um regular sessions and Natasha down and Natasha Diamond in Te Awamatu. She mm. does regular too. So yeah, mm. yeah we're definitely there somewhere. Hmm. So as someone that's been practicing yoga for so long, mm -hmm. and as a Maori woman what's your experience of the yoga world here in Aotearoa is it inclusive is it racist I know it's a big question but I feel like I can just ask you straight up you know you're amazing, you're well, amazing because Karen. you know these things don't necessarily get talked about and I appreciate what's, you. what's the real deal um it's not inclusive yeah sorry <laughs> no the, you do not have to apologize <laughs> I don't I never have these conversations with people other than my my own you know what I mean like us yeah. sisters 
to come together as, as women of color or indigenous women and so thank you for asking that question because I I'm not I don't really like to say it publicly because I don't want to cause hurt either but, but then that's like pandering to white fragility and stuff. Not that you're pandering, <laughs> but but you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, yeah. Things, yeah. I mean, I would love to have these things be said and people not get offended or take, but actually listen and get yeah. curious and go, oh shit, can we do better? Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, sure. So I what, think, what, what do you say? What do you talk about? Yeah, I think it's, I don't know, I get frustrated at times, you know, and I always have since the age of 14 when I first started practicing at the gym. And I, the whole class, we're talking a Christchurch gym yoga class. So it's all, yeah. all white women. Yeah. And then there's me, you know, and I felt invisible every time. You no, know, I try mm. occasionally try to like smile or engage with someone. And it was usually met with a kind of a, a, a closed wall. So, and, but they mm. all had their thing going on and it was like, I was different. And that was hard mm. for me because my, my mother's Pākehā and she's a beautiful open woman you know and I'm used to that but for whatever reason other women either felt threatened for, by me or just didn't didn't want to get to know me you know and so mm. it was kind of like feeling a bit cancelled you know like I didn't exist but I would still I learned to say I learned to um to nurture my my own thing around it and just go I'm here I'm here to learn this for a reason and I'm I'm going to stick at it and nobody's going to tell me because this this resonates for me as a as a Maori woman or whatever as a human as a as human a yeah spiritual, as a spiritual being this yeah resonates deeply for me and there's something in this and so I just keep going but I do yeah over the years I've had many experiences that have proven to me that the New Zealand yoga community is not inclusive at all yeah. of, of me and my kind. Um, I appreciated the time when I met you at the conference. That was me pushing to kind of go there. It wasn't, you know, yeah. I, I thought, it's not my ideal environment. It's not where I'm comfortable, but I thought, no, I am a yoga practitioner. I'm a yoga teacher. I'm carrying this beautiful taonga from commit that I need to nurture and care for and I also need to put a stake in the ground and go hey this is here too um and it's not because it, even comedic yoga can be very controversial because it doesn't come from where it doesn't come from where yeah. everyone else gets yoga from you know yeah so it can challenge others and but yeah I mean I found even that conference I found awkward for me it was awkward yeah. Yeah, I can and feel that and I you know like I had a sense of that too because I I look around and I see the brooms and I see that they're mostly white yes. and you know I just that felt sense of like how inclusive is this and what's being done to make it more inclusive and yes. yeah so I had a I had a sense of that when I saw you in the parking lot as well oh yeah you know? right. yeah, yeah yeah I appreciated you because you were so warm and yeah you time to kind of sit with me and stuff and I yeah. was like oh you really made a difference you know yeah well because I yeah. and I didn't know yeah because I could just feel that sense that you and I wasn't sure what was giving rise to what you were feeling you know yeah. whether it was coming in as a mighty woman was it something I didn't know but yeah. I just had the sense of wanting to to reach out and and welcome you into the space thank you you know I for whatever it. reason yeah 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 and I think so, I, I, a lot of the time I do feel like I'm kind of in this state of always trying to think how everybody else is you know like oh even though I know I look different and I feel different and I don't necessarily feel included or respected even as as tangata whenua but I mm. I spend time sorting myself out by going each of these people is on their own journey each of these people may have their own trauma and drama each of these people, maybe they are Māori, some of them. Like I try to go through this process in my mind so that I don't become judgmental and then start projecting an energy. But it's mm. it's not easy because then even just me going through that process is projecting an energy. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. 
And I'm just also aware of like, it means that you're the one taking it on and you're the one doing the work yeah. Yeah, yeah, as yeah. such. Um, yes. But so that's what, a lot of life. Yeah. Yeah. What, what could the yoga community in Aotearoa do? How, how to address? I mean, I know that's a freaking yeah. big question. Good um, question. But it's a great question. It's a wonderful question. And the thing is that, so Māori are deeply spiritual, right? Deeply spiritual yeah. people. We we have our own form of yoga, but we yeah. wouldn't call it that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it, I do haka. know. I'm aware of that. The path to yeah. enlightenment. Yeah. Yes. And yes. haka is very much that for us. Even it's a living, breathing expression of spirit and body and yeah. DNA and everything. And so we're very... The thing, the thing that I love about taking yoga into Maori communities is even though there is there is some distrust of it because yeah. of the way it is way it has been fed in the last you know fifty years is that it's a white person gym bunny thing or whatever or it's a white spirituality thing. So yeah. there is a lot of dist mistrust around yoga. I find in Maori communities, but I like to help them push beyond that and I just talk about it I talk about meditation because yeah. Māori actually understand we meditate all the time but we never call it that you know when mm. we're practicing haka we're meditating if yeah when you watch it how else do we end up with our eyes bulging and our tongues protruding out I mean that's <laughs> right you can't get into yeah. that state it's a in a it's not a physical state it's a spiritual state mm -hmm. and then also when we do things like more tear tear it's a it's yeah. a form of meditation that takes us away from our human so it's even though maori don't realize we're meditating when we do that stuff when we break it down and unpack it that's what it is and so i find that maori and people of color and culture very easily go into meditation and breath work because you know but um so in terms of what the yoga community can do I think they're just the ideal is that there is a bridge between the communities you know because I see the yoga yeah. community as being a white community I don't yeah. see it as being it's not you can go to yoga events and you can see it with your own eyes it's not like an indian community you know mm. it's a or anything or a color indigenous it's predominantly white and so i think just to continue bridging the gaps but also also being really respectful of tangata whenua the people of the land because there's so much history in every land that we are, we visit or we we're mm. present on. Tangata whenua are always holding space for everybody. That's what we do. And so there is so much to learn from the people of the land. And I think mm -hmm. if it was rather than being an inclusive thing, it was more of a le just leaning into um, what is already there would make a huge, mm. huge difference. Yeah, I there is that. leaning into what is already there, acknowledging. Mm -hmm and seeing and valuing appreciating what is already there yeah because it's already yeah. happening it's already yeah happening. and um i love what um you know i love what franco's doing with spirit fest and that he's returned to his ancestral lands his ancestral area he's yeah. tangata whenua he's from up kaipara area and then that's his own personal journey of reconnection. I'm, I mean, I'm I'm speaking for him, which is probably a little bit inappropriate of me, but I'm just making my yeah. observation and assumptions too. And then he's now going to be sharing that with others and sharing yeah. and inviting that existing community to come into it as well. Because as I was leaving on the Sunday, as we were leaving, I saw Matua Richard Nahi, who's the co martyr mm -hmm. of Kaipara coming in yeah. to do the yeah. kind of up and I was like oh yay it's yeah. Richard and he's so yeah. beautiful and you know him and his whanau and I was like that's it man and just continuing to grow those connections so that Māori feel safe to come into the space mm -hmm. and that when they come in at acknowledging that it is quite a big deal for Māori to come into the space and there's things that we have have to learn off tangata whenua so just mm. keeping that yeah that exchange and that 
that thing open in order to do that rather than closing it anyway yeah. I don't, obviously the, I don't have the solution but no just... I think it's just great for us to touch on it and just to acknowledge yeah. it just thank to a- acknowledge it um yeah thanks Carolee yeah you're brilliant yeah I mean my pleasure the least I can do you know <laughs> So many things. All righty. So I'm aware of time. Yes. Is there anything in particular that you would like to speak to before we wrap up? While I see if there's anything else I want to. I don't think so. I think um, I think we kind of covered some pretty good yeah. ground. Yeah. 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 Big ups to you. I mean, other than just to say, you know, just yeah, these are really these are really dynamic times that we're in, and just for us to look after ourselves and look after each other and yeah. you know have boundaries <laughs> something, I've, <laughs> something I've, learned, I've learned and am learning is boundaries and to respect our own boundaries and the reasons why we need them and have them and then respect others boundaries and mm. yeah, I think just um yeah just always to yeah just have have love have aroha for each other and as as a, a, yeah. fellow, a human you know on yeah the journey, spiritual journey yeah thank that you. was that was something else I noticed on your Instagram feed was the beautiful way during the mandates and the vaccine rollout that you spoke to the division that was occurring and you just spoke and named the fact that you know you know we're talking about our vulnerable Fano, for example but we're not necessarily talking about those who have received vaccine injuries who are also vulnerable and you had such a beautiful, inclusive way there of, of oh, speaking nice. to yeah. that. Yeah, it was a really I don't know. We, I was I was really struggling during that time, just w- observing all the different things, you know. And it was just like the pain, the widespread yeah. pain, and how the pain didn't actually belong to any one group. In fact, there was so many groups feeling this pain, and then there was this kind of wide and then there was this yeah this kind of division thing but yeah just it was it was really after having a conversation with a friend and she told me that she had felt pressure to get the vax yeah and and, you know there's this a lot of people would jump and say oh you're you're this and that because you got the vax but as a mother she felt pressured but she also felt like she had no choice but then her body reacted to it mm-hmm. and how devastating that was. And I just thought this whole picture is terrible. It's terrible. Yeah. And it's terrible that not only has she gone through this, but she's being vilified almost. Yeah. For, for having yeah. Been, you know, and then I was just like, this is awful. This is so awful. And then, and then my friends who, would not take who wanted to remain vax free for every r- reason that is totally you know valid and their pain of feeling excluded yeah. like they could, am I ever going to be able to be a part of society again and yeah I just thought man this, I, I yeah I was really struggling with it but that but that's also a part of just I feel like it's a part of being a child of a Pākehā woman and a Māori man and the journey that mm. me and my siblings have always had to walk of yeah. always having to have aroha for our Pākehā whānau and always having to have aroha for our Māori whānau and then feeling the pain of both and trying to work out how do we kind of weave these together and bridge mm. them. Yeah, so I, I don't know, that whole thing just burst out of me and I'm glad that it resonated for some in the way that it did because that's what I intended was to try and help break down some of those walls that people feel when we feel attacked or we feel yeah yeah I think that is part of what you're holding is that ability to be inclusively loving you know which doesn't mean necessarily condoning the behavior per se Not at but all. still holding the aroha and saying, I'm not going to condone the behavior, but I can still hold the aroha. It's, it's, yeah. a, it's a hard one, eh? Because I think we all struggle with it at different times. You know, say if, if someone we really care about does something really bad, you know, and then you're just like, how do I, where do I sit with this? How do I sit with this? But I think um, I got I got great advice from someone once when they said, in regards to a really good friend of ours who 
done something and they said um we they are our family we love them we care for them we will never desert them however if they have done harm then they need to walk the plank yeah, yeah. And, and only they can walk the plank on their own and yeah. then we will not let them um if they fall we will not let them drown we will not yeah. let them get eaten by the sharks we will never mm. deserve them and I, I always think of that yeah when I struggle with this whole thing I go okay what is it what is it okay it's the walking the plank but it's we will never desert them we will always be there for them we will always mm. but we won't let them drown and we won't you know that's yeah stuff. yeah beautiful well thank you <laughs> thank you for all thank that you speak you. up for on Instagram feed is amazing I love following it you name the things and just for what you bring into the world for your beingness Oh, and you too, Carolee. I really appreciate you and all the efforts you make. And I appreciate you. Um, I feel really honored that you reached out to me and invited me to come and have a cordial mm. today. Yeah, you're on my list. You were like top of the list. It just took me a little while to get the courage out. I'm like, okay, I have to, I have to message oh. you and ask her. <laughs> I know I'm a bit scary at times, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, blessings, blessings. Okay, thank you. Hey, so that was Nina Kay, an extraordinary woman, an amazing woman. Um, so gracious as well. Like I really did want to ask about what it's like as a Māori woman to, you know, to be involved with the yoga community here in Aotearoa. And I noticed that I got quite nervous and my, my I got quite red because it feels like, you know, dangerous territory for us to step into, but it also feels like we need to talk about this stuff and just name it that things are not inclusive, that it does feel uncomfortable, that tangata whenua are not necessarily honoured or respected or acknowledged or appreciated. And, you know, as a Pākehā woman, like, I feel awkward. I'm like, I don't know quite what to do and how do I broach things and what if I get it wrong and what if I offend someone? But as Pākehā, we have to step up and we have to lean in and we have to want to honor the treaty and figure out what that means to us so if you do run a yoga studio or you're a yoga teacher I invite you to do some inquiry in terms of are your classes inclusive um, are you aware of who is tangata whenua in the area where you hold classes um, yeah are there ways that you could operate that would be more inclusive mm. Mm. And of course, there was a lot of other juiciness in that conversation too, around sexuality, around Tinder, loved um, Nina Kay's openness about speaking about her journey on Tinder there. Uh, so, so curious. You know, I feel like having these conversations kind of gives me a window into worlds that I'm not necessarily experiencing. Um, because I haven't really, and you know, I've dived into Tinder every now and then for just for a couple of weeks, but I never even get to the stage of making a date and of course I practice brahmacharya so I don't have sexual um, intimacy with anyone that I'm not in a committed relationship with so that's different ah, all righty so I think that is it for this particular conversation with Carolia hopefully it sparked some stuff in you maybe it made you feel a little bit defensive be curious about that if it did and I will see you back for the next one in a couple of weeks Thanks for listening to Conversations with Karalia and trust that you enjoyed that nuanced deep dive into spirituality, sexuality, power and awakening. If you love my take on the spiritual path and you're looking for more insights like this, then make sure you subscribe and like. You can also check out my website, karalia.com. That's K-A-R-A-L-E-A-H.com subscribe to my weekly newsletter. 